Everybody see the slide? Yep. Yep. Awesome. They're going to talk about training a chat bot and how you build one. Uh, give uh, basically an overview of four different approaches that are commonly used. I won't go into the more advanced chatbots that are often built like question answering um, or trying to make it a little bit more uh, pro-social. Those are the sorts of things that you'll want to do in, a, in an actual production chatbot. Uh, otherwise, you get caught by the, the, the scary uh, uh, chatbots like Ty who, uh, that Microsoft released a while back and really uh, caused them a lot of trouble. So the, uh, talking about those different chatbot approaches, um, in the beginning, there was Eliza. This was a therapist chatbot built by a, uh, an MIT um, computer scientist. Actually, I think he was a, um, a physicist, but he, um, he used a particular kind of uh, psychology called reflexive type psychology, where you reflect back on the user uh, something about the emotion that they mentioned in their, in their text to the bot. And it fooled a lot of people, including me. Um, this was back in the, in the early 70s. There was uh, this bot out there on bulletin board services. Before there was internet, there was bulletin boards. And people would, uh, would have conversations with this bot. Uh, but that uses a thing called pattern matching. So all that required was extracting words from whatever the user said and echo them, echoing them back using a template. So you guys know what a template is if, um, if you've used something like uh, string interpolation or the doc format statement in Python, or if you've used uh, render template uh, commands in Flask. That's what a template is, and that's all the sort of uh, things that uh, pattern matching bots like Eliza and Perry were, were using back in the, in the early days of, of chatbots. Um, then there was Jabberwacky. Um, this moved on to a more advanced approach where you do retrieval. And this is a sort of chatbot that we were talking about on Slack recently, where you, in our case, we have a, a big corpus of uh, collection of documents of um, movie dialogue from IMDB. So this, uh, this movie dialogue um, has um, the statements that are made by one person in reply to someone else. And so we take those as our training set and we look for any statement that the user says in our database. If we find something similar, then we reply with whatever the person in the movie said in response to that. That's called retrieval or search uh, chatbot architectures. There's a, a third one that came more recently at the turn of, after the turn of the century, um, though they were being worked on uh, prior to that. This is called an ontology or uh, a logic-based bot. Sometimes it's also referred to as grounding. So these bots like pattern, that use pattern matching and retrieval, they tend to go off the rails. They ultimately end up doing things that are um, unexpected in many cases. And ontology and, and chat, uh, uh, a bot that's, that's grounded in an ontology and logic about the world is much less likely to go off the rails. They're able to stay within the confines of, of whatever um, knowledge they have about the world. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about more about the advantages of that. And then there's the generative and deep learning ones. Those are the ones that are the most creative, and so they are also the most dangerous and difficult to control. So the, re the recent advancements there were in Thai back in, the, in, in 2015, and then more recently with GPT-2, uh, a big chatbot built by OpenAI. Um, or not a chatbot, but a nat natural language model that can be used to generate text in the same way that we would for uh, a chatbot. Um, the big boys like Google and uh, with their smart reply, uh, DuckDuckGo with their search, and Elemental Cognition and others, they're using um, an architecture that's a combination of all of these. Um, mostly uh, using generative and retrieval, but they also use um, some of the other techniques as well, extracting information using patterns and uh, populating templates, and even a, logic, a logical database to, to access um, uh, tabular data. Um, so let's talk about pattern matching first. So like we said, there's a, there's a pattern first, and that is then uh, tied to a response template. Um, so these are typically regular expressions. 
But the regular expressions, uh, if you've probably not heard of regular expressions, but it's just a, a like the star character you would use to search for a file. It gives you a way of matching strings that aren't exactly like what you're uh, what, what you're expecting or what you're typing in. It gives you more flexibility in, in matching a particular statement. It also allows you to extract pieces of information in there. So um, a regular expression is a sequence of characters. It can also be a sequence of words that you're looking for or some pattern of words like a verb following an, uh, a noun or, or whatever. If you, ha if you have a particular pattern that you want to match, that's uh, generally called a, a regular expression or grammar. And then, um, and then you can use the pieces of that that matched your regular expression, uh, the, the, the text that uh, matched a particular part of your regular expression called a group. When you use grouping symbols, you can, you can gather up pieces of the, of the text into variables, and then you can use those to, to, to respond back to someone or to populate a database with knowledge about the world. And that's what Eliza did. Um, uh, so modern uh, chatbots and, uh, and search engines and uh, virtual assistants, they combine uh, grammar with search by, by looking for information in a database after they've uh, used the grammar to match patterns in your, uh, in your statement. Um, here's some good examples of retrieval search uh, approaches. Oops. Uh, looks like, uh, so now we're going to move on to retrieval and search. Um, this is, this is an approach where you're, where we talked about before, where you have the statement and response in some database of like from a, a movie, uh, dialogue. Uh, and so that, that works really well when all you want to do is have a conversation or be entertaining. Uh, one of the challenges there is that you're, you're mimicking all of the actors and all of the movies and all the characters um, by, with your chat box. So it doesn't have a really cohesive personality if you try to use this to actually carry on a conversation with someone. That's one of the challenges is finding a cohesive uh, dialogue set that, that covers a lot of the things that somebody might want to say to a chat box. And that's really hard. Uh, people don't like to have their one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, Recorded and then um, and then and, and even when they do, they're they're typically not extensive enough to cover all the things that people would want to say. But um, the what's the uh, like if you and if you ask for um, factual questions, as long as that information is is some is in something that someone has ever said, like in. Uh, in Stack Overflow, um, it's, it's a good way to, you can use Stack Overflow as a really great resource of question ans questions and answers for a chatbot. Uh, they have an open API that allows you to download all the statements and response. As long as they're short enough that you think that the, the user's question might line up perfectly with one of the answers and the answer is also short, then you can use those. But, um, um, and you can also use that for a help desk if you have some sort of a fact, a list of frequently asked questions and answers those make great help desk chatbots. However, you can imagine this doesn't always work. Um, the uh, I make some examples of some bad retrieval or search applications would be uh, if you wanted your chatbot to respond with some factual information about the world that's changing all the time, like what time is it? Um, the, the only kind of responses a retrieval chatbot would be able to say were kinds of things that might be said in a movie including all the different times that ever occurred in any of the movies that it read about, but also um, uh, uh, jokes and, uh, and quips about the time. So that may not be what the user is looking for, obviously. Um, and um, and, as, and I, as you can imagine, in some movies, there, there might be even some factual questions about things like logic, like what's one plus one? If you ask that of someone in a movie, they might ask, oh, it's three, and something like the ad men or one of these promotional mo movies about uh, people who are in the ad business and, uh, and or managers or inspirational leaders or whatever, they would not necessarily be giving you the kind of response that you want your chatbot to be as a calculator. And, um, and, and another application where you've got a chatbot that's required to know about the visible world, in the case of Ira, this was a, a chatbot that is designed to help uh, assist blind people by um, describing the world around them. Um, however, if it's uh, re trained by retrieval on all the history of dialogues that have happened with other blind people, 
of course, those responses are very unlikely to be appropriate for the situation that a particular person is in. So, um, so that's the challenge. So that's where ontologies or a knowledge base comes in. Uh, some sort of logical relationship between entities, between things in the real world, and letting the machine look, know about those things and do what's called inference on that graph of relationships between things in order to come up with an answer to a, any particular question. Um, this is also sometimes called context. Um, so you can, it's, it sounds a lot more complicated than it really is. But if you imagine that uh, list of variables that you're putting into the template um, as a database. So you can, I don't know if you've done this before, but in the dot format statement in Python, you can pass it a dictionary. And that dictionary can have as many keys as you would like, keys and values that would be populated into that template. And so if that's a, a database with lots of information like the person's name or the current time or their current location or the weather outside, that dictionary is essentially a database of lots of information about the world, then you can insert in your templates, these render to template uh, function calls that you're doing, like on in Flask or at the dot format statement, those, uh, those can be populated with information about the real world and your responses. And so that's, that's basically what this knowledge base is used for, is, is creating that context, uh, that database of information that can then be used within your templates. So they can be combined with the, the other approaches we talked about, the, the pattern plus template approach. And they can also be um, uh, used on its own if the user asks a particular factual question that's available to you in your knowledge base. Like, what is a cat? You could go through all the different things that a cat is. Well, it's an animal. It's cute. Um, it's a thing. <laughs> you, could, you could have your chat bot describe the various aspects of a cat uh, depending upon uh, using nothing more than logical inference uh, on your knowledge base. Of course, if you don't know what a cat is, if your chat bot doesn't have that in its knowledge base, then that can, then, then it's not going to be able to answer that question. That's the challenge of an ontology or a knowledge base is making it large enough to cover all the things that the, that the users might need to know about. So it only is really practical for um, a very narrow focused um, application like for customer service or a particular, um, where you have a particular list of products that you know the user is going to be interested in, or a restaurant reservation service where you know a particular list of restaurants in, in the town and you have a nice knowledge base of all the different things that, can, uh, that restaurants can serve and, and all the different services they can provide. That's, that's the sort of thing that works well with an ontology or knowledge base approach. Um, Another, a very common open source approach to building this ontology or information about the world is called AIML, uh, Artificial Intelligence Markup Language. It's, very, it's, an X, it's a version of XML that allows you to put in facts about the world as, as well as these patterns and templates that you want the, the chatbot to re reply to. So you can use variables within these. Um, it's a very, it's a static database. So it's not a very uh, fluid sort of chatbot. It can't evolve over time and it can't easily uh, learn from the user about uh, facts about the world. But it's a, it's a nice um, old, old uh, markup language that a lot of people enjoy uh, building chatbots with. Um, now, never ending learning, language learning. Uh, learns by reading using natural language processing from the web. So it's extracting this knowledge for the knowledge base from the web. Uh, and I actually labeled this the wrong number. So this is still part of the third um, approach to uh, building chatbots, the part that involves a uh, knowledge base. Now it's just showing us how it can be done. And then they've been doing this for almost 10 years now at Carnegie Mellon. And it's been able to build uh, a very, very large knowledge base um, it seems it knows uh, 500,000 kinds of categories, like that one I showed earlier, where a cat is an animal, and also relationships between things. Uh, so that's a, it's a pretty massive amount of knowledge that, that people, and it's open source, so that's available to anyone. And you can actually help train it on Twitter by, by telling it when it's wrong about a particular piece of information that it's extracted from the web. Uh, now we're getting into the generative, the deep learning approaches that have come out uh, very recently. In 2012, um, 
Jeffrey Hinton uh, showed us how convolutional neural nets can really change the, the way we think about neural nets and how effective they can be with high dimensional data like language. Um, he did it on images and then more recently people like Cho did it on language. Um, and we have this massive amount of data now in the form of uh, natural language data is called um, or a collection of documents of English text or any other kind of natural language text is called a corpus. And the Gutenberg project gathered up all the books ever printed that are out of copyright protection. And they scanned them all and OCR'd them all at Google and put them in this massive database of all these books. So I think those are all the books that were published before around 1950, I think. I'm not sure what the date is, maybe maybe 1940, but it's a, it's a lot of really good books that, um, that are useful for uh, training what's called language models, um, which are built by these uh, deep learning systems, these neural networks. Um, uh, these generative models are, are generally trained on pairs of sentences, much like we had before the statements and replies. You could also train them on things like you know, the translation between French and English or Spanish. Um, you can also train them on summarization uh, tasks where you're trying to generate a summary or a rephrasing of a statement uh, as the output. So on the left-hand side, you have whatever the first statement is coming in. And that goes through one of the most common neural networks is called an LSTM, a long and short term memory model. So it, it knows what parts of that phrase were important uh, way back or that were said early in the phrase or paragraph and um, the things that were said more recently and how, they, how their importance lines up to create what's called a, a thought vector. So this thought vector is very much like those word vectors we talked about the last time. The only difference is that it takes into account the order of the words. It's not just a, a single uh, entity like the, the vector for a word. It takes into account a much more uh, complex uh, concept besides just the meaning of, of a particular token or word. Um, it's taking into account the meaning the person was trying to say, their intent and everything about their intent, including all the logical relationships between the objects. At least that's the idea. Uh, it's a very fuzzy vector, very much like the word vector. It doesn't, uh, just like the word vector, you can't really generate a perfect definition of the word from it, but it's useful in uh, approximating the meaning of the thought that the person was having. And then once you have that vector, in this case, those thought vectors are about 512 dimensions, whereas the, the word vectors were only 300 dimensions at most. Thought vectors are 512 all the way out to even a thousand dimensions. You take that and then you can actually run the LSTM in reverse almost. It's a little bit different process, but you can use it to generate random new text, created text out of that thought vector. And that's how it's often used for um, translation, summarization, paraphrasing, um, and even uh, chatbots uh, for reply. I won't go into the details of how that works, but here's a diagram of one of the neurons. It's quite different from what you're, you've, you would use in a normal um, deep or, or fully connected dense layer like we showed for that um, for the in the last presentation on talking about natural language. Um, I'll just bring up the, the architecture that we're currently using for um, for this, um, actually, this isn't this isn't quite a this isn't the architecture we're using right now. But this is just another view of that architecture of the pattern matching, extracting of text, and and putting it into a database such as uh, a knowledge base that can be then used later to populate uh, future templates. So now I'll just show you a, a demonstration of a chatbot that the one that um, I think we could easily deploy to the, the server if Julian has time. Uh, so I'm going to, where am I? I'm getting the correct directory. I would make it larger so you can see what I'm doing. Just a moment, once I get things working.
So what this is doing right now is it's just loading um, some natural language models, like those those deep learning models I talked about. We're not really we're not really using them in this particular chatbot. I'm just getting ready for the future when we might want to. Um, it's loading a model called Spacey that has those word vectors and other um, nice uh, features of it. It can label like the parts of speech of text as, and break it up into words and punctuation. It's a really awesome tool. So that's what I'm using it for here. Um, uh, now I'm going to actually run the So if you, if you ask, this is the, the easiest, the fastest way. Now it's got to load all of those statements from the, um, from the movie database, and it's got to compare them to this statement that I just sent the bot. Um, what is your name? I'll also do it from the command line. This is an actual bot that you can use in your bash shell prompt. So what it did is it found the closest thing to what I said was, what's your name? What, what, what's your name? Uh, I guess that's pretty much what I said. Oh, yeah. So I said, what is your name? In the movie, someone said, what's your name? And uh, uh, the mammoths are up in this place. That's right, the mammoths. So that's what, um, uh, that's what the, the chatbot could come up with based on the, the movie dialogue that came out. You can see how this isn't all that awesome. Uh, for Except for being entertaining, that's about all this, this chatbot is going to be good for as a as a movie dialogue uh, chatbot. Uh, there was another one that was kind of interesting. Uh, what's up with you was an interesting one that uh, came up with uh, a mo some movie dialogue from a person who was having a conversation with a police officer, it seems like, according to what this came up with in this response. It's going to take a while. It's going to go through 60,000 possible movie dialogue responses. But found what's what's with you as the closest statement that somebody said in the uh, in the dialogue, and so the reply was the person they were talking to was get out of the car. So uh, that's uh, these are not very helpful and responsive chatbot replies, but you can see how you can make it happen. I'll give you a little more insight into how this thing works by showing you some of the code. Um, it's not as complicated as it looks. Um, Let's see, just a moment, let's bring it up. Here we go. And I'll, I'll particularly focus on the, the pattern bot. This is all the code that's required for a quick pattern bot. And I'll turn off the big, the movie chat bot so that we can then, um, we can use just the part that's doing the uh, the pattern matching. First, let's find where. So this is the CLI bot uh, means command line interface bot. So that, that means you can type bot space and then anything you would like, and the bot will reply to it. So I'm going to get rid of the um, the search fuzzy bot. So that's the searching the movie dialog, and just have it use only the pattern bot, which is this simple thing over here. Think, oh, I didn't put a colon at the end. There we go. Here's the pattern bot that it's loading. So this is just a greeting bot. So this is the kind of thing you would do if you had some, the, the opening move, but just like the opening moves of a chess game are already planned out ahead of time. The opening game, the opening moves in a conversation typically are as well. You know how it is, how you have a, a ready response whenever you, anybody asks you, how are you doing? Those are the sorts of things you would want to hard code into a pattern matching chatbot. In this case, I've, brought, I've decided to incorporate uh, a compliment for any bullies out there that are trying to make fun of the bot by calling him a bot. So if, if, if they say something like, hello bot, or hi bot, or hey bot, then, um, then this thing will respond, hey, that's a good one. Uh, at least that's the idea. Um, not actually sure that it's gonna work, but we'll give it a shot. So I'm gonna exit out of the, the Python console so that it'll have access to that command line interface bot. So this is how you use it from the command line. It's, a, it's very slow and we don't have it as a service yet where it already has that database loaded. So if you just type bot 
and then you tell it what you want it to, to say. So I think that, that pattern was I bought, and that should bring up that special response that we programmed in. Um, that's, a, that's a quote from uh, a prayer from Open Me. Uh, obvious, obviously not about bots, but it was about uh, a bully making fun of Owen Meany in the, in the novel. Um, uh, hey, that's a good one. So it worked. And it went pretty fast. You notice it didn't have to search a big database of movies in order to come up with that one. And you can say a lot, of course, you can say almost anything else you would like. Um, you can't use uh, special characters like uh, apostrophes, though, if you, if you don't put quotes around it. But, uh, but you can see how you can, you can program in the responses you want from your chatbot if you know what they are going to be. You can only do that from the very beginning. It does have to load the spacey model each time, but other than that, it should be pretty fast. Um, there it is. Uh, because I use its real name, um, Mycroft, um, it likes that. So it resp responds with something else special. So I'll show you that. So this is what I was talking about when I said regular expressions. Make that a little bigger for you. So the first thing we're looking for is just a match of the words, hi, hello, or hey. Notice I've done them all lowercase. So when the statement comes in, I lowercase the entire thing. And uh, so that it, so I take the statement that came in from the user and I lowercase it so that it can be compared to this, uh, this regular expression. So this is what the, the, the vertical bar means in a regular expression. It just means or. And then, um, and so I've got these three possible words with an or between them. I've got parentheses around them, so that becomes a group. And then I've got parentheses around this other group over here. Dot star means absolutely anything. So everything that came after that is going to be captured in that dot star. The slash b's just means there's some kind of separation between that and the rest of the statement. That it's some kind of, uh, uh, which means it's like, it can be the beginning of the line, it can be the uh, a space between words, it could be a hyphen between words. Those are all considered a break character. So that's what I put here in my pattern. And so, so anything that comes after hey or hello, as long as there's a break after it, um, that, will, that will be captured in the second part of the group. So then I check that second part of the group. And as you remember, Python um, indexing is zero offset. So the second part is just the, the square bracket one part. And so that's what, what I, how I grab that piece of text. And then I check to see if my cross in it anywhere. Um, and if it is, no matter you know, whether it's got spaces around it or anything else, as long as it's spelled correctly, it'll, it'll respond with one of these three possible options. And it's going to choose them randomly because I've given them each the same score. Um, this bot re re replies with multiple possibilities so that the, the executive can decide what's, what the, what the, uh, what's best for the user, depending on all the different options that we give it back. And so uh, and, uh, and here's that one I talked about from A Prayer for Open, OME, and uh, where you compliment the bully so that he gets off your neck. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's looking for the word bot in any any of the, any of the text that came after the uh, uh, the hello or hi. So those are the two ba most basic kinds of chatbots, and um, and then we're and you're now building with the unredacted one of the most advanced ones, the deep learning ones. Obviously, we haven't had time to show you how all that works or how to actually train one yourself, but. But you can see how they are, they're getting easier and easier to use as more and more of these libraries are out there. So does anybody have any questions before we wrap this up? Um, no, not, not yet. <laughs> okay. Are you, who else is there? Um, Tyler and Alex. Julian had to leave because of tennis tryouts. Oh, bummer. Yeah. Okay. But you can listen to the tutorial later. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording and stop the share, and we will wrap it up so that we can.